This week, we're having a discussion and interview with Dr. Jack Grapple. Sports, a lot of things in sports. I would say sports scientist, researcher, human performance specialist, author, speaker, biomechanist. Yeah. The list goes on and on. Looking yeah, I was, I was fortunate to meet Jack in the late 70s. We were both being spoon fed by Vic Braid at the same time. I think if Jack is a tennis professor, I remember the USBTA magazine, Ask Doc. Definitely a pioneer in the tennis teaching field. He's currently at Judson University. He was at Northwestern as a professor. He was also at Illinois as alma mater, where he played college tennis, coached the men's team, founding chairman of the Sports Science Committee with the USTA. Almost 20 years he led that um, committee. Yeah, 16 Co- years or something like that. Yeah. Co-founder of the Human Performance Center with Dr. James Lair. Yeah. Now the Johnson Johnson Human Performance Center. A PhD in biomechanics, uh, but certainly went on and he's an expert in wellness, nutrition, human performance, has worked with world-class athletes spanning 25 sports, presented literally thousands of lectures on six continents. Yeah. I believe he's uh, written over a dozen books. He's a master pro with USPTA and PTR, honored by numerous tennis federations around the world. Uh, he helped us in the 1980s with our educational program. In fact, we uh, use one of his books as a textbook. Definitely a voice in tennis uh, that needs to be heard and not forgotten. Yeah. But uh, let's call up uh, Dr. Jack Grapple. All right. This should be go. fun. Yeah. Prolific speaker. Funny, funny guy. Hello. Jack. Hey. Dr. Jack Grapple. Dr. Jack Grapple. Hey, thanks for being on the Great Base Tennis Podcast. Hey, great to be with you guys. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I, having you. I know when we talked to you uh, on a Zoom call, the beginning days of the pandemic, we actually said well, this should have been a podcast. So we're, we're, <laughs> Yeah, we had fun. Yeah, we had a we fun, had fun, fun conversation. But, yeah, uh, reminiscent. This will be a great, right. great treat for our listeners. Um, let's get rolling now. Why don't you start with your junior days, uh, being a foreign exchange student, growing up in Illinois, playing tennis at Illinois. I mean, obviously yeah. tennis uh, was your gateway to seeing the world and doing so many different things. Tennis opened so many doors for me. It's, it's, it's almost hard to imagine. And I mean, how it happened, I was a baseball player um, as a young kid. And when I was 11, my mom and dad, who didn't really play tennis, they said, we want you to take tennis lessons because we think you can play it for your whole life. And I thought they were crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I really didn't like it at first because I was a baseball player. And then I just, every now and then I'd play. And when I got to be 12 years old, 13, I just said, you know what? I kind of like this. I started a really good friend of mine was a tennis player. And he went on to play at the University of Miami um, after we, we were the same age, played in high school together. And he just kept asking me to play. And we did. We went to a couple of tournaments and I kind of liked it, even though I was struggling and and then I just committed myself. I never took a lesson, Steve. I, I, I had a, my high school coach was our basketball coach. And uh, the only lessons I had were at YWCA when I was 11 years old. Did you spend some time against the backboard? Oh, my goodness. It was crazy. And then, <laughs> and then as you just mentioned, when I was 17, I was a foreign exchange student in Guatemala for a summer. And then, uh, and then that was the year before I was a freshman at Illinois, and I walked on and and made the team, and that was uh, the beginning of, you know, I had an okay, I had a lot of fun, I had an okay career, played mostly doubles, and uh, then I just, uh, I, you know, I was I was actually got my undergraduate degree, Steve, in wildlife biology, wasn't even in sport, wasn't sports science or anything, because my father was pretty tough, and he wanted, if I was going to walk on at Illinois, I had to get a good degree, right, so I started grad school in population genetics, um, and then I didn't, I just didn't like it. And my sister, bless her heart to this day, my sister, my older, my big sis, she said, why don't you go talk to the people in kinesiology? Now I'm 22 years old and I'm an absolute mess. And I go to talk to the people in kinesiology and lo and behold, they admitted me to the master's program in kines. And, and then they asked me to teach tennis for the, for the department. And then I met my advisor, my future advisor, Chuck Gilman, who was a professor and he was the one that literally said, um, if you really take the bull by the horns, this is 1974, Steve, 
And uh, he said, if you take the bull by the horns and really apply yourself, he said, I think you could be, I think you could really be a leader in the science of understanding tennis. And that was all it took. I just felt, I just really applied myself and started really small writing and doing research. And then one thing led to another. And then we get caught up with how you and I met actually. Yeah. Back in the days with Vic Braden, I know when he had his uh, USTA, the United States Tennis Academy, uh, I attended that uh, 10 different times, different capacities <laughs> as, as a student, then as a staff member, then when I brought students, but it seemed like uh, in the early days you were always presenting. At first, he had two per year, and then at one time it was just one per year. Yeah, it was pretty amazing because I had written to Vic because Vic was doing a lot in the very similar things that I was doing, and I was taking a very kind of an academic approach. And I wrote to Vic, wrote several letters, and then he realized what I was doing. And Vic and I got connected by letter, and then we had a few phone calls, and suddenly invited me out. I, I really do owe the kickstart of my career first to my advisor Chuck Gilman to get me started but then to Vic who just Vic Braden just opened doors for me um as a tennis scientist oh you and Andy should get together because Andy uh, other than Melody I think Andy spent more time with Vic the last 10 years of his life so you spent so much time with him uh I, I don't know 40 years before that um right exactly no I was with Vic I mean, how many times? I can't. I can't even tell you. Uh, numerous times per year, I would go out to California from Champagne and spend with Vic. And then, I mean, we could, we stayed very, very close all the way. Yeah, and then you got so uh, active with uh, as an educator throughout the country, going section to section with the USPTA and the USTA. Can you tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, what happened? I mean, it's fascinating. It's how I met Jim Lair. Um, you know, right from the 70s, I think the first really big event I ever presented a scientific paper at was the 1976 Olympic Scientific Congress that was associated with the Montreal Olympics. And I was at Florida State. And Bob Singer and I drove up to uh, uh, Montreal and Quebec City for, you know, from Tallahassee. And I presented two or three papers. Um, one of them, only one of those papers was on tennis. But that was sort of the kickstart to me you know, studying and getting more involved. And then I got hired back in Illinois as the men's tennis coach um, and a professor. And then I just started traveling. And then it was, I, I uh, Eve Kraft heard about what I was doing and she invited me to speak at the National Tennis Teachers Conference. And that was when I met Jim Lair. And then I just started, I mean, then it just snowballed. I started just traveling all over because people really liked the scientific validation to see the high speed films in really slow motion to talk about, okay, what are, what are we understanding? What, are we teaching the way we were taught, or are we teaching really what happens in, in the stroke? Yeah, I remember uh, teaching, we used to say, are we going to teach what's happened or what's happening? It's, it's very <laughs> right. much like today. Um, it's almost like the follow-through doesn't exist anymore. Everyone just mistakes the recovery as a follow-through. Right. I mean, that's, you know, that, but that again, you know, if you look over the last, you know, half century at the game. I mean, not sure. Obviously, technology. I mean, the equipment, the shoes, the equipment's changed. But what we know about nutrition, what we know about exercise physiology, what we know about sports psychology. I mean, we're not even dealing in the same arena. Some, you know, when you think about what, how we've evolved in training. Yeah, I mean, there there is definitely more use of video these days, thank goodness, but a lot of times it's misinterpreted. And then the practical application side of thing is how do you get somebody to do those different things that you see? That's also the part that, well, you know, is not understood very well. Right. And that's where I always talked about the art and the science of coaching. You know, it's one thing to, and, and a lot of people are surprised when they hear me say this because they know me as a scientist and they know me as kind of a mm -hmm. data driven guy, but there's an art to taking that information. And then how do you get the right output from a player? And that's where, you know, some of the great coaches and I don't disagree at all because some teaching cues are very, very successful psychologically. And you might even be saying something that doesn't happen with physics, yeah. but it works psychologically with that player. Right. No, exactly. Yeah. yeah it's like the keeping the ball on the strings or, uh, you know, you tell someone to come over the ball, they, 
they start closing the racket face more at the right exactly the they, 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 they close it too much like hit a ball down the line hit the outside of the ball you know that kind of thing and and but it's a teaching cue it, it it that doesn't happen but it but sometimes these cues trigger something in a player's brain that gets them to perform the necessary uh, movement yeah and then also the reverse is true where you know people try to describe things a certain way and then and then some of those movements that would just be because of forces involved or passive now those become problematic because they're literally trying to do something you know exaggerated and, yeah, you're uh, reminding me of something Vic always said, that if you really come over the ball when you try to hit top spin, you're going to hit yourself in the foot. Exactly. How does the ball come up I mean, through the strings and go his, over the net? <laughs> yeah, that was one of his classic lines. Yep. Yep. With the USTA, sports science, it seems where you know, so many myths were debunked in the 80s with yourself as a biomechanist. I mean, obviously, uh, Vic certainly... Gave, with his television show, with his books. Uh, right. I mean, he was on talk shows and Hollywood squares and, but it seems like the myths uh, are still there. I mean, do you, how active are you with the game now? I mean, do you pay close attention? Do you listen to the commentators? Does it drive you nuts? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it still does. The, mm -hmm. uh, they're better, but I mean, how I got involved with, you know, at a national level with writing, like I, you know, I, I, uh, 1983, I'm not going to say any names, but in 1983, it was a commentator at the U.S. Open um, made a statement about rolling over the ball to hit top spin. And I wrote a letter to World Tennis Magazine. And said, because in those days, you don't have electronic mail and you know, mm -hmm. they're not going to pick up the phone call from this, you know, this guy in Illinois who mm -hmm. says he's studying the game. So I sent a letter with these high speed pictures from film to say that what this person, this commentator had said on this tip was absolutely wrong and they invited me to write an article and then i then I, now, now i'm writing for world tennis and then tennis stepped in and then for gosh i was 10 to 15 years maybe i was an instruction editor for tennis magazine it all it all started with me writing that letter to world tennis magazine about something that somebody misspoke on at the u.s open on television you should write that commentator and say thank you for your dumb remarks I've made a career out of it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. I truly appreciate your, you, you, your misspeaking. Yeah, you really launched my career no, in writing. No, but that's inspiration. Uh, you were proactive and you stepped up. And yeah. With, with action, well, that's the whole there's thing. a result. You know, doors, yeah, I, I truly believe doors open in your life. And what I always do with our students, I mean, I'm a professor now again. And I always say, when those doors open, are you ready to walk through them? Mm -hmm. Because that's what preparation is. When the yeah. doors open in life, are you ready to walk through them? But as a professor, I mean, I can remember, uh, well, you came to Tyler Junior College where we had this two-year program. You were there several times. Yeah. Um, but I remember yeah. walking across campus. You'd be just like Vic where um, you could teach in several different departments. What, what are you teaching now? Well, it's interesting. I have the only job like mine in the country. <clears throat> I have a joint appointment in business. And also, I'm a professor in business and I'm a professor in exercise and sports science. And I'm also the faculty athletic representative for Judson University. Mm. It's a small Christian university here in Elgin, Illinois. And I, I just love teaching again. I'm so, I'm so pleased. So happy. And that, that's where you grew up, correct? No, to... I grew up in Alton. You're close. I grew up in Alton, which is in southern Illinois near St. Louis. I'm near Chicago now. Okay. Uh, tell us about nutrition. I mean, we could go out. We could talk to you forever. But um, Oh, my goodness. Nutrition has just evolved so much. I mean, when I was a kid. You know, and playing, I mean, like two things come up. I was told don't drink water, you know, because <laughs> it'll, it'll it'll make you, it's a sign of weakness if you're drinking water. Right. And take salt tablets. And I mean, we, you, know, you look back on that now as a scientist, you go, we were killing ourselves. Yeah. Um, you know, and now you've got all these sports drinks and, and players have their own homemade, they work with dietitians and they have their own electrolyte drinks made. Mm. Um, you know, so the idea of, you know, the amount of protein, like nutrition on how to recover quickly um, is just a phenomenal area right now that's still growing and getting stronger is that, you know, we used to think that you need to eat very soon. We used to say that just eat or drink something very soon. Now we know that you need to be, if you're out there longer than 90 minutes, which most matches are, uh, you need to be consuming uh, energy drinks. Uh, Mike Bergeron did a lot of research in this arena 
And if you haven't been, you need to, if you don't eat within like five minutes, the, the body doesn't store as much glycogen. So, I mean, the area of nutrition from the idea of energizing the system and recapturing energy after energy expenditure is truly a fascinating area. You're saying after a match, yeah, you, you've got to restart yeah, after, after, after a hard workout. Yeah, yeah within like wanna, 15 wanna, minutes, right? Like is the best. Oh, yeah, you don't want to wait that long. I mean, they, they, I think Mike would even say, if it's longer than 90 minutes, you, you need to be getting something in the system during the competition, like the energy drink that has glucose in it or something like yeah, that. Yeah. And then if you, 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 need to, you need to replenish the system almost immediately when you get off the court. Right. Well, I, I asked about nutrition because in following your career, uh, that seemed to be a focal point. I mean, you were uh, speaking with all these world-class dignitaries. Um, did, you, did you, you had to go back to, back to school basically on your own because you didn't really study that in school at being a biomechanist, no, that's, correct? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I had to, I had to relearn and I had to get certified in, I got a nutrition counseling license. Uh, but I had to do, I had to go back and study. Um, it was hard because, you know, here I was, I was counseling a lot of players and they really wanted to understand nutrition and training. And so Jim was taking care of, Jim Lair was taking care of the psychology end, and I was taking care of the physical end before we really built our business. Um, so I had to get, I had to get this right. And yeah, you're right. I wrote the, the book in the mid nineties called the anti-diet and, then I had the great fortune. What a blessing I had to travel the United States for five and a half years with some of the world's biggest, most well-known dignitaries in huge arenas and sell the product, the anti-diet book and, and, and gear that went along with it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you and uh, Jim were basically tennis specialists and then certainly <laughs> the, the world just started there for you as far as getting into uh, so much. Tell us about the Human Performance Center. Yeah, it was great. You know, Jim and I, we, we created a Florida corporation in the fall of 1991, and, and we opened our doors on January 1 of 1992. It was then called, we were the first two people involved. It was called Lair, get this name, Lair Groffel Saddlebrook Sports Science. And that was what, that was really the first name, because we were at Saddlebrook, and they wanted their name in it with us. And because we built, we built a solid reputation, and we used tennis. And, and then in 1995, we, I, I wrote, Jim, Jim was writing books at an incredible rate. And I wrote the anti diet book. We moved to Orlando. And, um, you know, Jim was a prolific writer. And I was, I was right. We're still working with tennis players. Um, quite a few. We, you know, our course at, at Lake Nona that we built, we got an investor who built the institute at Lake Nona. And, um, gosh, we were so blessed. We had Sampras and Courier training there. And, you know, we were working with Arantxa Sanchez Vicario in the early 90s. I mean, it was it was really an amazing experience. And then we started working with corporations in the military and law enforcement, healthcare. I mean, the funniest story is that one, it was probably 1994, 95, we were moving to Orlando. And Jim and I were still really known as tennis people. And we met with a very, I won't say the name of the company, we met with a very large Florida corporation. And we left the boardroom and I'm, I'm like the little energizer bunny. I'm ready to talk. I'm excited. And Jim, and Jim puts his fingers to the lips to shush me. And he says, no, you like that. And I went, what's wrong? Why? Why can't I talk? He, he, he pursed his lips and put his finger across and says, shush, shush me. He wouldn't let me talk until we get to the car. So we get to the car and, and he, he says, roll up the windows. So I go, dude, it's hot. We're in Florida. He goes, he starts laughing. And I said, what are you laughing about? That was a great meeting. And he goes, he says, for goodness sakes, don't ever let those guys know we're a couple of tennis coaches. <laughs> I mean, it was, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that moment. And, you know, we, we used the science of tennis and, and training athletes to go, you know, that whole idea that there's a great athlete in all of us, but mm. you do have to train, you know, mentally, emotionally, you know, spiritually and so on. And it, it, it was just phenomenal. What a, what a, what a career Jim and I were in a business that Jim and I were able to develop. And then, as you know, he sold it to Johnson and Johnson in 2008. And now you're just chilling on a yacht. Hey, I'm a so. professor. <laughs> Come on, dude. I'm working full time. No, I'm just teasing. But it's so, it's yeah. so true. There's so many parallels, right? I mean, as far as being successful in business life, whatever, um, right. the things an athlete has to do. 
yeah there's all those exactly. different parallels so it's great how that can just cross over right i was gonna no, ask no you um just while we're on the topic of performance but nutrition especially what what advice would you give for let's say junior players especially like teenagers where they really will you know go for anything cheese it's whatever oreos yeah. um what advice would you give to young tennis players as far as their, their nutrition goes yeah i think a lot of young people they think that eating well is just kind of the day of event you know when in fact what we know today it's more you have to think about your nutritional status in other words you know in fact i'm just the opposite to what people think today people think today you know, the urban legend, I think, is that if I've got a match day, I'm going to eat well today. <laughs> when, in fact, if you haven't eaten well, you know, until that day, I mean, I'm much more on the psychology end. I would much rather see you eat really, really well as a training athlete. And then on match day, if you want that, if you if you tell me that it's just going to take a hamburger for you to play at your absolute best that day, <laughs> I'm going to go, how do you want that burger prepared? <laughs> you know, those nuggets. But, because it's. It's more lifestyle that you've got. If you really care about being a performing athlete, nutrition is a lifestyle. It's not just a one-off. Right. And, you know, these days there's a lot around being more on the plant-based side of things, you know, players like Djokovic, but also, you know, um, shows like the Game Changers, um, a, lot mm -hmm. more, a lot more vegan athletes out there. What are your thoughts on, on you know, the plant-based stuff? Well, it certainly can be done. Um I've never been a big fan of it because I can I get concerned about you know Pete, you got to understand that people like Djokovic and the top player the top athletes we read about they can have their own chef and their own dietitian mm. the average person out there I'm okay with being a vegan I'm not I mean I have nothing against it whatsoever my biggest concern is making sure you get the right amount of protein that you use the, the vegetables you're eating the plant based diet you're eating has enough mixed protein in it that you're getting complete protein mm -hmm. i also care that you're getting you know for example if you have no red meat at all then i just want to make sure you're getting vitamin b12 for example right because if that's not found that if that's only found like in seaweed for example so the and i'm, I'm really quite serious about that but vitamin b12 if you don't eat red meat it, it's a rare kind of a vitamin yeah most people take a tablet <laughs> I'll take the vitamin right, B12 exactly. tablet. Right, exactly, and that's not the best way. The best way is through food, but, you know, if you don't have the food, then you then that's the next best is the supplement. Right. That's good. What about hydration? Same kind of thing, right? I mean, you, you can't just try to hydrate the night before a match. It's got to be something where you're hydrating days in advance, right? Or yeah, again, it's up. a lifestyle. It's yeah. a lifestyle. You, your body is your laboratory, and you need to understand that you need to understand how do you feel when you drink a lot of water. See what a lot of a lot of young athletes do. They wait until they're thirsty, which they and intellectually they know that's too late. They know the body's response, yeah. the thirst mechanism is too late. But what they don't realize is that if you if if, if you're not if you're not drinking sufficiently to the point that your urine is not clear, if it's yellow and dark yellow especially, um, you're dehydrated. Yeah. And your body is your laboratory. So how much do you drink? What do you need to drink, you know, to get your urine so it's clear and, and not, you know, maybe a mild, light yellow, but not dark yellow. Right. And no Coca-Cola. Well, you know, if you need it now <laughs> and then, you know, I'm, I'm, not the per I'm not the kind of person that says never. Right. I, think, I think when we do that, then we end up with problems with closets people that you know i'm gonna drink my coke you know yeah, so exactly. <laughs> you want one now and then have it you yeah. know i'm not yeah uh let's come back to the I'm professional back. side uh in a second but on the personal side tell us about being a mountain climber yeah mount well, kilimanjaro I, huh <laughs> we did after getting my knees replaced i got my knees both my knees replaced in 2010 because my son is adopted from china and he was at the time he was six years old five and a half years old and I got my knees, both my knees replaced from all the abuse I'd given them um, as a junior and throughout my young adult life. And, um, and then in, in uh, 2015, I started thinking about, you know, the, a lot of few people know this. My father and I, were, I told you earlier that he was pretty rigid on me, but our relationship was pretty estranged. But one thing that we did when I was a junior in college, we drove to Alaska 
and camped the entire time. And it's kind of a wonder that we didn't kill each other. <laughs> but the one thing is when my father passed away, the pastor that spoke at my dad's funeral, uh, all dad ever talked about, he said, was the trip to Alaska. Mm, that's cool. And that's I think about it all the time that I think that was the beginning of my dad and I improving our relationship. Mm. Um, so I wanted to have a journey with my, an adventure with my son. And I'm kind of the go big or go home kind of a guy. So I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to just drive to Alaska, you know, because <laughs> I, I'm not going to do that. So I started looking around and I've always had an affinity for Africa. I'd only been there once before. I did a tour in South Africa for the Tennis Federation of Southern Africa back in the eighties. And I've always wanted, and I, and I just started looking around and all of a sudden it hit me that Kilimanjaro is the highest mountain in the world that you can hike. Um, there's no technical climbing. Um, obviously, it's extremely high. It's just mm. under 20,000 feet. and But it's the highest mountain in the world that you can actually climb with no technical gear. Mm. And I said, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> so I just kept doing more research and more research. And in 2000, late in 2015, I said, I'm going to do it. And my son um, has a cleft palate. Um, and I just I didn't know how he would adapt to altitude. So mm. I took him to... Um, uh, in 2016, I took him to Rocky Mountain National Park, and we did a hike for his scout group, scout troop. Um, we did about six miles between 12 and 13,000 feet in Rocky Mountain National Park, and, and I and he he did great. And I asked him, you know, how he felt and everything. He said, "Great." And I, and we did it all week. We hiked at very high altitudes, and I said, "Want to go try to go higher?" He says, "What do you mean?" I said, "Maybe <laughs> a mile higher vertically, more than a mile." He goes, "What in the U.S.?" I said, "No." <laughs> and I told him, and he said, you know, he's got this very laid back personality. He goes, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> so the next year, we sure did. We got a group together and we he, we went on a safari for five days the first week. And then the second week, on it, we were on the mountain for eight days and we made it to the summit of Kilimanjaro together. Father That's and son, awesome. he, was, he was the youngest on the mountain and I was the oldest on the mountain the, the week we were on the mountain. Are you 7-0 yet? You must be close. <laughs> Getting close, awfully, awfully close. <laughs> <laughs> and how long? How, how long ago did you have both knees, uh, and were they both done at the same time? They were both done at the same time. I had them both done in November of 2007, 2010, Sorry, and then he and I summited Kilimanjaro in two thousand seventeen. And just to be clear, we're not talking about your NTRP rating. We're talking about your age, right? You guess seven zero. <laughs> <laughs> that was well played. That was well played. That was well played. With your, right. with your knees, uh, biomechanically sound. With <laughs> yeah, uh, what was the rehab on that? You're just oh, it was awful. You get both knees done at the same time. Oh, for three months, I really didn't do much of anything. I, I mean, I did all my rehab, but you really struggle mm-hmm. getting them both done at the same time. But I'm glad I did it that way. Now it's probably better than, than ever, right? I mean, the technology yeah, is amazing. I, mean, I, I got a checkup with my doc in May, and he did x-rays and everything, and the the artificial joints are better than, as good as ever. Yeah. And great. I certainly am not, I'm not, I'm not a wallflower, so I certainly beat them up, but they're good. Jack, back to biomechanics. Um, yeah. Stanley Plaganoff, Gideon Ariel, uh, were there others that influenced you? Well, Chuck Dillman was the guy that got me started. And then yeah. Terry Ward at Florida State was my advisor. Bob Singer, who was the president of the International Society of Sports Psychology. Bob was on my committee and district, my dissertation advisor with Terry. You know, all these people. But then when it comes to biomechanics, I mean, Vic and Stan Plagenhoff was at Massachusetts. What a what an incredibly smart man he was. And Gideon, with who worked with Vic, I mean, you know, Certainly. And then, then there were some people in Europe that Richard Schoenborn started doing a lot in uh, Germany. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are probably the ones that I worked with the most and got to know the most as mentors and leaders. And Paul Roeder, uh, he speaks highly of you. You oh. uh, mentored him, correct? I did. He actually, it was interesting. Paul actually applied to Illinois to study under me and it didn't quite work out. And then he goes to get his PhD at Connecticut and then he gets hired by the USDA and then we start the uh, USDA National Sports Science Committee that I'm the chairman of, and Paul's the director of sports science. So suddenly, we end we do end up working together, and we've been <laughs> dear friends ever since. Yeah, he's back with the USDA now. I, I think he is. He is with um, 
Certification. What are your thoughts on certification in the USA with, with tennis? Well, specifically, what's your question? I mean, I'm, I'm a big time believer that we need to have certification, but what do you have a specific thing you want to talk about? Well, just where it is with um, the alphabet soup of tennis, you have the USTA and the, I guess on the political side, the USPTA, PTR, do you think it'd be better if it was just under one umbrella? Uh, is it better to have two separate well, organizations? That's a hard one to, to, to call. I do, you know, because there's different, I mean, certainly you and I just talked about it. There's different ways to teach tennis. I mean, there's the art of coaching. I thought ben, Dennis Vandermeer had a, the standard method was brilliant. But at the same time, I like USPTA's perspective that you could teach many different ways. Um, mm. So, I mean, I thought there was a place for both. And I'm, and I'm a member of both. And I'm an international master professional at ETR. I was one of the original ones with Arthur and Billie Jean and Jim and Dennis. I was honored to be that. And then, uh, you know, I'm a master professional with USPTA. I'm honored there. It, it's been, it's been an incredible ride. So it's hard for me to say that there's one way to teach tennis, no, you know, so, should yeah. there be a unified certification? That's a hard one, you know, because there are, there, I mean, you can't say let's get politics out of the game because it's already there. Mm. Um, it's already there. So how do we figure out how to make this work? I do think there needs to be some unification and I think we're headed toward that somehow. I think that's what, uh, where, where Paul was brought back to the, the, um, the USTA. It'd be great. I just think, yeah, Unification. I think there's consistent. Yeah, I think that's what we need. We need a consistent voice for the trade, for the tennis teaching and coaching profession. And I think Ann Grossman's doing a great job with the Women's Tennis Coaching Association. You know, so there there are quite a few out there that are that are existing, and we just need to keep working toward unification and having a similar voice for our coaches. Our, our curriculum, uh, great base, one of our students, Richard Hernandez, said to me in a conversation one time, tennis needs a great base initiative. So we just started calling what we've assembled as a great base. And when I started at 26, uh, with that two-year program he helped us with, uh, I had already been trained by Welby Van Horn, Dennis, right. Van, Dennis Vandermeer, and Vic Braden. Um, right. But Vic was really more of a, I mean, obviously, formally, he was a um, psychologist, as far as education, but he was really a, a I, would, I would say, or what we say is a self-made biomechanist. Um, he was. I, I mean, he was really uh, asking lots of questions. The intellectual curiosity was there. Yeah, I think what what really helped Vic, and I and I really took this too, that I think Vic's background in psychology helped him a lot in being able to teach mm-hmm. and being able to be humorous and help people laugh at themselves. Um, and then, and then, but then come back to the serious side about the science of the sport. Vic, Vic was brilliant. He was a brilliant teacher. Yeah. I mean, all the research, you know, you just have information and then obviously then there's applied information, how you get someone to take that information and okay, let's, let's make this practical so that it can help you. 100%. You know, I put up a video from, I, I think it was the time that you spoke at tennis tech. Um, back, back, back in the eighties, you know, and it was of, of, I had hair and it was dark hair. Yeah, no, no. You were looking sharp, man. You had a nice, uh, I don't know if you had a, a nice collared shirt as well, or, a, you know, one of those big gigantic collars, but, um, you know, the video is great because you're talking about, and I think it was, uh, Tim or Tom, one of the goalies, um, hitting a volley and you were just talking about action reaction Right. And some of the things that like on the volley that are misinterpreted where, you know, it's just the force of the impact that pushes the racket down. But then you'll get coaches that'll say, you know, to try to carve under the ball and things like that. And that's a little bit yeah. okay feel, but you know, that's just one example of biomechanics. If you just understand the physics involved, what's actually happening there so that the players don't go, Oh, I want to try to do this. And then they end up just, you know, literally trying to turn their, their racket under it or chop way down on the ball. Um, I think that's where I don't feel like people are really unified on, on some of the basic kind of information like that. Oh, I think you're spot on. I think the problem is that we, we tend to not make the game simple. Yeah. If you really try to simplify the game and just teach to get the, you know, what we've all taught, 
get the racket in the right place at the right time. I don't mm-hmm. care how you got it there. You know, I'll never forget when Borg started playing. You know, everybody thought that he didn't have a chance or his arm would fall off. Mm-hmm. You know, and yet when the when it got to the impact point, he was perfect. Um, and I think the we have to understand the game should be simple. It shouldn't. We can't teach to make it more complex. So when you start thinking carve under the ball to volley, I mean, you just brought in a lot of miscellaneous movements and muscle actions that make the game more more difficult. Yeah, and then all the variables to calculate as well. Right. Exactly. You can't do it. You just can't do it. Like you were saying, you know, you don't care how you get there, but in some ways you do, right? Because as far as just being efficient, you don't want to have all these extraneous movements and all these moving parts. No, no, parts. I was saying that. I was saying that. I was saying that extemporaneously because yeah. what matters is that the bracket's in the right place at the right time. Exactly. But if you've got if you've got a lot of extraneous movement, you're not going to get the racket in the right place at the right time. Yeah, especially so, under pressure. That's the point. Absolutely agree. I was only speaking yeah. extemporaneously that. The key is getting the racket in the right time, right place at the right time. But if you've got so much going on before or trying to do it during, there's no way you can do it. Yeah. yeah. I Like years ago, I tell people all, all the time, you, you would, as a biomechanist say, there's bio, no mechanics, bio mini mechanics, <laughs> and, and bio maxi mechanics. Yeah, and I love that. We did. I haven't heard, I haven't, I haven't thought about that in a long time, but we did say that. <laughs> and it seems like um, for... You know, I'd say a, a large percentage of tennis teachers, tennis coaches are bio, no mechanics. But then there's some who are, you know, trying to for, throw out the $14 words. They really are creating paralysis by analysis. And the art is to be right in the middle. Mm-hmm. You want to know as much as you possibly can, but you need to be able to uh, enter your student's world. I used to love how you would break it down that way. Yeah, it's great. Well, you know, I had a lot of success teaching it that way because bio no mechanics means you're oblivious to science. Bio maxi mechanics means you're just way over the top. Yeah. And and then and, and the problem is that if you're using one or the other, if you're on both extremes, the student usually can't hit a bull in the butt with a bass fiddle. <laughs> so the the issue becomes that it's bio little mechanics. You know, you don't have to you really don't have to really impart much mechanics to the student mm-hmm. as long as you, the teacher, are teaching them how to efficiently and effectively get the racket in the right place at the right time. Yeah. What are your thoughts on like, just for example, uh, people, we always, always say, you know, people are trying to reinvent the wheel. I mean, the physics of how to hit a forehand topspin, whatever, are really aren't going to change. Like you said, technology changes, but like these days you hear first it was modern forehand. Then it was, I don't know right now we're at next gen forehand. You know, I mean, uh, people are always trying to (laughs) reinvent the wheel, it just seems. I always say it makes makes no sense for everybody to put in their two cents. Well, yeah, exactly. What's fascinating is that you're you're exactly right, that the mechanics, the actual mechanics, the physics of the ball hitting, I mean, the racket hitting the ball, Mm -hmm. create top spin, that really doesn't change. Now, all these techniques, have to do with preparation and follow through and what they're trying to do is get more racket head speed with the a biological system. The human being is a biological organism. So what they you know, I'm not saying that these teaching cues are wrong, but the mechanics of the racket, what the racket has to do to get it is it, still the same. Now you you might try to get more speed and that's where they talk about modern forehand, whatever they're calling it now <laughs> in today's world. And the um but the mechanics of the, what the racket does with the ball, that interaction really doesn't change. Yeah. I mean, I just, I think it's funny to, to, if you were to call like Andre Agassi's forehand an old school forehand. <laughs> it's like, come on. <laughs> right. Um, often we would send people to YouTube and there would be like a, uh, I don't know if it's there anymore. I don't think it is actually, but there's a Borg Federer forehand comparison and it was literally exactly, it was a carbon copy. Exactly the same. For, well, it was just a 95 Wilson versus a, you know, a Don A wooden racket. I don't know if you ever saw it, but I had a young, I had a young junior player when we were at Lake Nona. This is in the late nineties. Um, and I, uh, he said he, when he start when I started working with him, he says, I, I'm going to, I play just like Andre Agassi. I hit the ball just like Andre. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, let me see it. And wow, huge wind up, and then huge follow through. And I said, you think that's Andre's forehand? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I hit it just like Andre. 
Mm-hmm. So I filmed it. Mm-hmm. And then I got a film of Andre in the same in the same position and I split screened them. Mm-hmm. And I actually showed that at coaches conferences. And what I did, I started with the impact point and then I backed everybody up. Mm-hmm. And I told the coaches, I said, These are these two are gonna hit the ball at the very same time. And Andre was still in a ready position and this kid was starting his backswing way up high. And all Andre was, was shoulder turn, rack it back, he got in position, impact, and follow through. And, and meanwhile, this kid is going through all this extraneous motion yeah. and hits the ball. I mean, like I mean, a, like a full second of backswing <laughs> that he thought that he thought he was hitting it just like Andre. Yeah. Andre's so compact. Yeah, that's right. a, that's a danger. I mean, you want it there's certain fundamentals that you have to do like we were talking about from physics and that you'd want to copy but then at the same time there's only one agassi you you know even just by a lot you know physiologically his brain type whatever you want to say if motor skills the way he grew up playing against the the monster 2000 balls a day on the ball machine standing on the baseline the things that created andre you know you're not going to be able to copy no and then you know the naked eye plays tricks on you we we always used to say what you see isn't what you get yeah. You know, because what the naked eye can see isn't doesn't help you. Yeah. You you perceive what's going on and it's really not what's going on. Yeah. That's amazing nowadays with technology like my cell phone can, can shoot a thousand frames a second. Yeah, how, and, how, uh, how crazy is that? How <laughs> crazy is that? We were saying back in the day, you know, Vic Braden filming Jimmy Connor's serve, I think he was paying a thousand dollars a a serve. <laughs> Well, that. in 1981, in 1981, I filmed the Masters in Madison Square Garden, and I got in there to take high speed films of, and I got Borg and McEnroe and Connors. I got mm. them all in, on high speed film, and in the background, the lights in Madison Square Garden are flipping on and off yeah. because they're 60 cycle lights, yeah. and I'm shooting at 150 frames a second. So, so literally, it looks like the lights in Madison Square Garden in the hallways are flashing on and off, <laughs> when in fact they're continuous stream to the naked eye. Yeah, I mean, I'll exactly. never forget that. Yeah, that's cool. I'm drawing this. Uh, I'm having a senior moment. I don't know if you have any of those yet, but uh, <laughs> the, 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 the writer is it David Foster Wallace? Um, yeah, yeah. From Champaign. Mm-hmm. Did, in your yeah. did, did you know him at all? I know he. he I did not. I did not. Yeah, he must have been much younger when, uh, what years were you at Illinois? Well, I went to school, uh, bachelor's and master's, 69 to 75. And then I went back as the coach from seven, and, and on the faculty, I coached from 77 to 81. Then I stayed on as the faculty until 87. Yeah. I th- anyway, he's written, you know, in, in his lifetime before he passed away, he wrote so much about tennis. He, I just wondered if, uh, if you cross paths, I'd have to go back. No, up. I don't remember him. But he, uh, yeah, he was a junior player. His, um, his father was a professor at uh, Illinois. Yeah, you'd have to have to look it up. What was the name again? Uh, David Foster Wallace. I was thinking of David Fo- Wallace Foster, but it's yeah, Davis, David, Foster, David yeah. Foster Wallace. Yeah. Um, I have to look that up. But, um, yeah, novelist and... Um, highly regarded, and but he was a tennis junkie, basically. Um, huh. Wondered if he. Was, um, I don't recall because actually, you know, um, Jennifer Roberts, who went through our program, actually she worked. Well, I know in, Jennifer really well. She worked in our program for two years, and then uh, Craig Tiley. They both uh, <laughs> we both became coaches at Illinois. Yeah, Craig's done very well for himself, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. That's what she, Charismatic, hard very, worker, very organized. Very proud of, um, very proud of Craig. With uh, no hockey Craig team. Craig turned the entire tennis program around at Illinois. Craig got fundraising. He got the recruiting. Then he wins a national title. Craig, I mean, Illinois tennis is, is what it is today because of Craig Tyler. No, that's a very nice compliment. I was just, I mentioned that uh, – the only bad thing about the University of Illinois is there's no hockey team. I guess they have club hockey. I know they, I know they have a they have, ranking They have campus. club hockey. Yeah, they I, have club I always hockey. knew it was a really good school because one of my sisters went there to uh, get a master's in math years ago. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's a great school. So she gave me a sweatshirt when I was a kid. You could appreciate this. The, uh, the Champagne Skyline. <laughs> it was a sweatshirt with... Uh, <laughs> It was it was a cow, a and, of cows. A cow and, and corn stalks. That's uh, 
That's the type of place where you can watch your dog run away. Uh, Pat Burns, a hockey coach, said that about Winnipeg. You can look out your window and just watch your dog way, run away for three days in a row. <laughs> what was yeah, the that's story? quite humorous. In fact, when I was a freshman at Illinois, I mean, the tennis, the guys on the tennis team, we'd go hang out on Saturday nights. We'd go to these local hangouts, and there was a band that was really, really good. We got to hear them probably at least once a month for my freshman and sophomore years. And the guys on my dorm floor, we would do whatever we could to go hear this band. They were just so good. Well, two years later, this band, which was based out of Champaign, is REO Speedwagon. <laughs> wow. That's they became cool. one of the top rock and roll bands yeah. of the 70s. That's cool. In the 80s, 70s, 80s. Yeah, 70s. Jack, when you're on uh, YouTube, like all of this, um, we always say YouTube clips and potato chips, you can't have one. Do you look at any of the uh, internet tennis gurus? And, you know, you mentioned modern forehand. Andy says there's uh, 20,000 choices. And I say, oh, so, way I, more than that. I say sometimes <laughs> way more than that. It's like, if you were to tell me that's the way a snake went down a hole, I would say, yes, I agree. But do you, do you look at that at all? And, and uh, Vic said that about the internet. So much bad information is going out so fast. Did you look at the internet coaches and what they're teaching? You know, I don't. I don't. Good for you, because if you're talking about don't. health and wellness, it's something you don't want to do. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it, it's uh, you know, the, I mean, the famous joke in academia and in science is that, yeah, I had a well-known resource, the internet, you know, I mean, yeah, and then everybody laughed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you, Jack, I mean, all, obviously so much experience and, and with all these different athletes and sports human performance, I mean, just for our listeners, whether it be they be a player or a coach, I mean, what are some of the things that you've learned from all the different, you know, I guess all your different experiences, but maybe different athletes that you'd say, I don't know, your top three or five things that are most important as far as just even life, but athletic performance well, and excellence. I well, think number one is what real perseverance is and what real hard work is. The a lot of people don't realize that. I mean, we hear about it all the time. Like we hear about the fact that Michael Jordan, you know, worked harder than anybody else. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, having been around world class athletes much of my adult life, I mean, they are not afraid to work. They won't miss a day in the gym. They won't. In fact, if anything, you've got to get them to schedule recovery time. They want it. They want to work so hard mm -hmm. if they're really, really good. And so that's one. It's the they almost redefining what perseverance really is mm. um the next is probably uh being constant learners yet um being in control being responsible vic always said this in fact be an independent thinker mm -hmm. that's probably the other thing i learned from really great athletes that they needed to be an independent thinker and um they were, they worked them. So they wanted to learn, but then they want to figure it out on their own. They, they need, they know they need to be responsible for their own actions. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is probably humility. I mean, it's really amazing. They're, they're extremely self-confident. You know, some of the, I've, I've had the great fortune to be with some of the greatest in the world. And yet at the same time, even though they're extremely self-confident, they're not egotistical to the point that it, it hurts their performance. Mm. They keep an even keel. That's how they learn. They don't have the highs aren't too high and the lows aren't too low unless they win Wimbledon or the world championship. Then mm. it's then all bets are off. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, they keep everything no hot. There's no you're not too high and you're not too low. They, they learned how to keep an even keel with their own humility and and uh, their own self-confidence. So I think probably those are the top lessons. I think, you know, humility, going back to humility. Is that where it's just important to have the right people around you that can kind of keep you grounded? Because I'm sure, you know, if you're 20 years old or like a Coco Golf who's just really young and you have all this attention and money and, you know, fame, you know, we talk, we talk about when kids come here, it's, it's all about character, that the forehands and backhands, that's the easy part, but really it's just kind of how you're living your life and the character. What's, do you think that's what it is? Is it just the people they have around them or is it just the parenting or all of it? I think it's all of it. And I think the people you have around you, you've got to have people that disagree with you and you can't have yes people. So that mm. becomes your posse if they're all yes people. Mm. And, you know, if, if that's the case, then the motto has got to be leave your posse at the door mm. um, because you won't change if you've got yes people. You need you need people to keep you grounded. And that's where 
really good parents play a role, parents that aren't so involved. You know, I'm not a big fan of, of, even as a coach, I've never been a big fan of if the athlete wins, I say we win. I'm not a big fan of that. Yeah. Because I, what, what I hear when people do that, we won or, or he or she lost. We played it. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. If this is a we thing, you're in the, you're in the thick of the bad too. Yeah. Um, and that's where people have to realize that um, I think great coaches and great parents, they are the support mechanism, but it's, it's the athlete who has to do the performance. That's really tough, you know, as well for especially younger kids to go, okay, I'm going to take this coach on who, who isn't a yes person. Cause I think a lot of them, you know, they don't have that maturity where, okay, here's a guy that's telling me I'm crummy or I need to do this. I need to do this. You know, most of the time they just go, oh, okay, you're fired. You know, it seems well, to me, you know. But you got to remember, if you're going to be a constant learner, you're going to constantly be out of your comfort zone. Yeah. And you need you need people that are loving. You want love, but you also need people that will get keep you out of your comfort zone and not let you get too comfortable. Yeah. And But yet at the same time, love on you and help you with your confidence level. It's a really fine line to be a great coach, I think. I think it's a really, really fine line to be a great coach because it's unconditional love, but it's also tough love sometimes where you create discomfort for growth. Yeah. Do you think that maybe the the building of the relationship of trust comes first? I mean, not to say that you just have to be a total yes person, but kind of build that rapport. And then once you have that trust, then you can have those doses I would of say honesty. Yes. Yeah. I would say absolutely yes. Without trust, I mean, there's no safety. You've yeah. got to have psychological safety to be able to make change in someone's game or to give them advice. You, you have to have psychological safety. Yeah. Jack, I wanted to ask you about federations. I know you've traveled and worked with so many federations. Yeah. Uh, one time when you were visiting our program, and this was back when I think six of the top 10 players in the world were from Sweden. Mm-hmm. And you told us, we, we do this drill to this day and I love it. You said you learned it from the French Tennis Federation because they played 50% tennis, no winners, because they just had to learn to keep the ball in play and, and really be patient to, to take on the yeah. Swedes. Um, with our listeners um, you know, from one country to the next, what are some things that in, the, in America, like what could we learn from the, the French or the, 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 the Spanish? I know it's, um, that you've done that. You've gone from country to country. Yeah, Yeah, I think we have to learn how to fight. I think we have to learn how to compete. And that's what they do in, in South America and Europe. Uh, they, they really learn how to, how, there, there's an incredible sense of team, but there's also an incredible sense of competition. And it's, it's healthy competition. I mean, look at the Spanish Tennis Federation today. Oh, my goodness. I mean, how many top players are from Spain? I mean, it's just ridiculous now. Back in the day when I was really active, I mean, it was Sweden, as you said. And, you know, everybody wanted to be Sweden. Now everybody wants to try to play with Spain. But, all right, then are you ready to get on clay? And as Vic, Vic was one of the greatest at the statement, too. Vic would say, you know, a great clay court, a great, great. If, if you're a hard court player and you're playing somebody on clay, you're happy if the ball goes three shots. Yeah. You know, you're going, oh, my gosh, three, four. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to finish this point. And Vic's going, this might go to 100. You remember yeah. that? Yeah. yeah, and Vic would always say that, and I mean, it was it's still true to this day that I think sometimes we we become impatient, and we need to figure out how to become more patient. And you know, our best players are huge servers. Mm-hmm. We're not we're not ralliers. Well, you know, especially. Got... Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, especially today with some of the analytics, where they just go well. Points only last, you know, three or four hits. So just, you know, <laughs> hit a big serve and then try to smack a forehand, you know? Yeah, that, again, um, that gets back to the training. You gotta, you gotta be careful looking at statistics like that. Yeah. Because, yeah, the points statistically might be shorter, but you will win matches by understanding the court and the geometry of the court and understanding how to set up a point and finish a point. That's yeah. where you'll win matches. Yeah, I don't think yeah. that, ten, I don't think coaches, working with 12 year olds in their formative years need to be going serve plus one, serve plus one. You know, so they're trying to, you know, smack a serve and smack a forehand and, you know, and it carries over. Um, we're just dumbfounded by how so many players in singles 
say a righty just keeps moving to their left to hit forehands. It's like they're avoiding the backhand altogether. The approach shot is becoming a lost art, the volley, the, the overhead. And doubles, uh, even at the Division One college level in men, it's becoming predominantly one on one, one up, one back. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. When I was the director of player development at Hotman's after I left Illinois at Saddlebrook, I was working with so many juniors. And I could see that they, they were good players, but they struggled with setting up a point and finishing the point. And we got to a point where they'd get in, they'd get in rallies and we'd, 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 use, we'd use ideas like, what's going to be your money shot during, during this? And that, that wasn't the shot you win the point on. The money shot was setting up the point. Mm-hmm. Then the next shot is you cash in on the, you cash in. So I tried to get them to develop a sense that what's the money shot going to be to set up the point. And it was fascinating to use those analogies with them. Yeah, we, we say often the money shot's the approach shot and the cash in shot's the volley, but you don't, you don't exactly. see a whole lot of that Absolutely. anymore being in great volley Absolutely. position. You really don't hear that. You don't hear that very much. Yeah. Uh, hardest working athlete. Just give us two or three uh, just off the charts uh, mm-hmm. who comes to your mind. Well, Jim Courier has to be up there among the top for sure. Um, just a blue collar tennis player, amazing athlete, cared about, wasn't, wasn't afraid to, to work. You know, I had the great fortune to work with Kathleen Horvath, who, if you'll remember in 83, Kathleen was the only person on the WTA tour that beat Martina, mm. Nebraska Lova, and she beat her at the French Open. Uh, and Kathleen was, I was at Hotlands and she was there and she was one of the hardest workers I've ever seen. And Kathleen got the top 10 in the world, I think. Um, you know, it, it's, um, they're far and few between when it comes to who's the hardest worker, because all of them work hard, but they but those are two that just stand out way above others. And what do you think that, is? I mean, is it, you know, when you work hard, is it just all, all aspects of, of, you know, training? I mean, is it the recovery, the, the amount of just physical fitness driven. they put just in? Driven. Absolutely being driven. Yeah. You know? Um, I mean, just don't let up, just being driven to be the best they can possibly be. And I mean, some athletes to a fault, they go there, you know, they, they don't build recovery in, they, it's all about work and suddenly their, their bodies aren't growing. They're breaking their bodies down and that's the negative to the really hard work. So there's a, that's where, that's where a coach really comes in. What's the right amount of work to create growth? What's too much work? What's too little work? Yeah. Does the adage, you know, listen to your body, is that, you know, oh. you got to listen to your body or is it kind of like, well, you got to push past that point a little bit. So important. So important. Yeah. Well, you were at um, Hopman's uh, after Mr. Hopman passed away in 84, correct? Yes. Yes. I went there in 87. That's correct. So you, did you catch uh, Paul McNamee? That was a little bit before your time where he. Well, he was there. He came to Saddlebrook quite a few times. I, I did. I did work with Paul. But okay. I got to spend some time with him. Great guy. Because he uh, he totally revamped his game. Um, you know, I've read his book, uh, but I remember watching him at Hopman's. Uh, you know, he went from being a one hander to a two hander. He changed his grip on That's the right. forehand side, and he he literally hit the backboard for like eight hours in a row. Um, I know. How about Roland Yeager? Was he there with uh, his daughter Andrea? When you were there? Oh, yeah. Roland and Andrea. I worked with Andrea a little bit. Yeah, they were both there. Yeah, Andrea was injured. She was injured quite a bit, though. That was toward the end of her, before she retired. But, no, I spent quite a bit of time with Andrea. Yeah, she's an Illinois kid, too, huh? Uh, she is. Didn't miss. I mean, she would just get so many balls back. Um, N- never miss. Never miss. What was she, number one in the world in the 18th when she was 12? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh I know a really good tennis player who, uh, you know, and I got to work with love and love. Go ahead. Susie Mascaren and I got to work together a lot. And I was, I was with Susie at Wimbledon one year and I talked to her about two years ago. We had a good laugh about this, that she was, uh, Susie was number one in the world in the 18. And one of her matches at Wimbledon, she's playing this little blonde girl from Germany who just sliced her off the court and beat her seven, five in the third. That was Steffi Graf's first win at Wimbledon. <laughs> wow. 
That's cool. And Steffi, I think, was like 13. Yeah. And just carved so her. Young. Just carved. And Susie played well. I mean, it was 7-5 in the third, but Steffi just carved with that one-handed backhand fly on grass. Yeah, people used to talk about her forehand, but so few people hit the slice. Uh, when you interview oh. players, uh, they would tell you that they didn't like playing against Steffi because of the backhand Oh, my side. gosh. You couldn't get the ball. You couldn't get her slice backhand. You couldn't get it up and down. Mm. If you tried to hit it hard, you just couldn't get it up and down. How about with the, uh, the track and field? What comes to your, what are a few comments would come to your mind when you think about working with, speaking of Jim Courier, um, he, he said that I thought I was an athlete till I stayed in the Olympic Village. <laughs> when you're with, with, <laughs> with those athletes, what comes to your mind when you think of uh, track and field athletes? Well, they're specialists in today's world. You know, this is not the era back in the day, you know, of the, uh, you know, the, the 40s, 50s. You know, I was in the, I was in the arena. I told you I spoke at the Olympic Scientific Congress in, uh, in, in Montreal and Quebec City. Uh, but Jenner won the, uh, won the decap on that year. Yeah. And the athletes are so different. I mean, and because we know more about training, we know more about nutrition, we know more about, I mean, it's just, it, it's almost like you really shouldn't compare the athletes, you know, because they're so big and so strong. I mean, I, I, I haven't seen any anthropometric studies of current tennis players, but I mean, yeah, you had the Stan Smith and Arthur was tall, but they were very thin and wiry. Mm. I mean, today, these, they're thin and wiry, but they're muscular today i mean they're stronger than ever we're getting six foot what is it Karlovich and opelka are six eleven, and you know i mean it, we didn't have that I, I can't remember a player over six six back in the 70s can you no no i i'd have to stop and now we got some that, we got two two players that have been in the top one opelka is now top 25 and he's six eleven. <laughs> We didn't see that. We didn't see that. Yeah, back it, in, Victor Maya comes to my mind, but I think he's six seven. Six, yeah, eight. Victor. Victor was six seven. He played. For, he played at Michigan when I coached at Illinois. We played. I played against. I didn't play against him, but I coached against him. And Victor was six foot seven. You're okay. right. With, um, I think that uh, the athlete, the tennis player, has really improved. You know, in the. Uh, in the gym, on the track, at the dining table, but not so much technically. Um, you know, granted, we were wrong years ago, and I appreciate what you had to say about uh, Dennis Vandermeer. Uh, you know, we consider ourselves to be Braden Knights. Um, I mentioned Jennifer Roberts a few minutes ago. She's highly intelligent, and she really, she really took to Braden's scientific rationale and. I remember saying, well, I don't know about Dennis Vandermeer. And she had never met him, and he was coming to our campus. He came every year, and I said, "Yeah, well, just wait. He will <laughs> spin everybody's wheel. The group dynamics, it will be, you know, he wasn't, like, as detailed as Vic. But right. um, but I I think that, you know, actually, Welby Van Aert, I remember being in the nursing home with him, and he, he actually, he did so well teaching the young Victor Amayas of the world but he actually changed kids from what he called uh, the beginner grip to the championship grip on the forehand side. He actually taught people to go to a continental, but that was right. back in the day of the wooden rackets and, um, you know, the, the three of the four grand slams on grass and the second week players right. playing on with, with uh, the, the, the forehand. We were, we were so off on the forehand back in the seventies from a tennis teaching standpoint, you know, the shake hands, shake hands, 180 degrees yeah. swing on a 20, yeah. 20 degree court. But, right, right. But I, I really think that, um, that, like the term Finnish player, now if that means you're from Finland. That doesn't mean that you can finish at the net. Um, <laughs> what, what, are your, what are your thoughts on, you know, why, why has that occurred? Is, are people trying to win at too early an age? I mean, they just program, the athletes program from the beginning to – be a one-dimensional player? Why don't you see com so, more, more complete players? So the player, again, is that you're asking me to talk about? Yeah, what? just and, and, and why, do, why do we, you know, like see Pete Sampras, we always say the last time he played an official match, he came to the net 104 times just in one match. 
Um, but people didn't really copy Pete, you know, class champ, class act, or like Narato Lova had her one hand and backhand under spin approach and won Wimbledon nine times. And I always throw it out there that a tennis group is hard pressed to to name nine people that have hit that shot since she's retired. Yeah. Is that, you know, you know, what would you think the answer for that is? Why is tennis? Well, I think, I think we specialize way too soon. I think, um, the, you know, the two handed backhand is actually, to, it, it's much easier to learn than a one handed backhand. And I think tennis players, uh, achieve a level of success early with the two hander that, you know, as you know, Pete played with a two hander at first and he, um, I think it was Fisher, uh, who changed his backhand to a one handed backhand. Um, so Pete actually started as a junior with a two hander. Yeah. The, I think, I think very often we specialize so quickly that we don't let them. I mean, how many times have we run into a great player that has a two handed backhand, but then can't hit a slice approach on the backhand side, mm -hmm. you know, and the, and the, and if the, the player on the other side can carve the ball and keep it down low, if all they've got is a two hander, we come back to what Steffi did with Susie. You know, what I talked about earlier, it's hard to get that ball up and down. If all you've got, all you've got is a flat or a top spin ball. So they never learn how to use one hand. And, then they, they start to learn by wide balls and a wide ball's out. Then they start to get a feel for the one hander and stretching. And I think we really have to be careful about specializing. And I think this is in general in sport. I think, you know, if you look at the great players, Courier was a baseball player. McEnroe played soccer. You know, there, there are so many benefits to early in age playing a variety of activities and yeah, play tennis, but do a variety of things. They will make you a better tennis player. Being a specialist early on doesn't necessarily going to make you the best tennis player. Yeah. yeah well, especially that early success curse, basically, you know, where, well, I'm winning, you know, <laughs> in the 10s and 12s or 14s without having to have an approach shot and a volley and an overhead. Yeah. How many number one in the world in the 12 became number one in the world in the, in the pros? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's there's a, there's you a book, look that up. There's a book called Range. It talks about, Oh, uh, the generalist is better than the specialist in the end. In the end, in yeah. the end, they are. Yeah, it's like, throw, know, the, like the, throw everything but the kitchen sink at a kid. Not, But uh, yet now I think many kids, they do. They play one sport early on. I know Fetter's always saying play multiple sports. Well, I think that's just well-rounded development, too, on top of it. Yeah. To, you know, soccer is just an, an amazing sport to develop footwork. You know, basketball, eye-hand coordination. You know, I, I just think there's other things. Now, the issue is you don't want to get hurt, you know. So, I mean, if you're at the pro level, I would now I, I back I back off that a little bit because if you're making if you're living, just playing tennis, you got to be careful recreationally playing those other sports. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Tom Gullickson, when you're jammed his thumb or his finger real bad, and he's left he was a lefty, and Tom jammed his left finger real bad and couldn't play a couple of few tournaments, and I mean that hurt. Mm -hmm. That's your living. Yeah, we have we have a, a, a pretty impressive library. Uh, so we have uh, many of your books and tapes and audio tapes. This would be to challenge the memory bank. Um, you used to talk about the kinetic chain, that some of the differences <laughs> between a one-handed backhand and a two-handed backhand. Could you? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, this you, was my di this was my doctoral dissertation, Steve. Okay, one-handed versus two-handed. Yeah, what I did, I had thirty-six. Uh, national class women players, and I was I was at Florida State, and they were and they were having a big open tournament, collegiate tournament at Florida at Tully Gym at Florida State, and I got them to uh, let me film them, and it was three dimensional. I had one camera at the side and one at the top in the in the ceiling, and they the cameras were synchronized, mm -hmm. and what I had them do, they had to hit a ball from a ball machine that was calibrated, the ball the ball they hit then had to have either be flat or have slight top spin it could not be under spin and then it had to go above the net and then it like under a rope but was four feet above the net so in other words what i'm trying to do is get the racket to do exactly the same thing mm. and at, at impact and then i got 18 one-handers and 18 two-handers and it was one of the first three-dimensional analysis because remember if i'm shooting from the side the x and y axis is is um uh it's behind the player, in front of the player, and mm -hmm. up and down. 
But then if I'm shooting from above, the X axis is the same, but the Y axis now is depth mm. from the, from the camera below. So now I, I've got, I can, I calibrate it. And now I can do a three dimensional analysis. And that's what I was able to do. What I found was that there were basically five segments involved in the one handed back end, that there were, you know, the hip, the, the, the shoulder, then the upper arm, the forearm and the hand actually played in the, in the role in the development of pace. The two handed back end, on the other hand, was only two segments. It was the hips and shoulders moving together and then the mm. arms moving. Um, so in my mind, that's what made the two-hander much more much easier to learn. Well, it's interesting, too. You know, Vic got so into brain tapping with, with John Neednagel. I don't know. Are you right. familiar with John's work at all? A little bit, yeah. A little bit. I mean, Vic was so into that in the end, but then it would go down to motor skills where, and this is so true in the women's game, that most of the top champions on the women's side are SFs, which is gross motor skilled, hitting big right. ground strokes, especially two-handed backhands. And then on the men's side, they're, they tend to be more on the fine motor side. But yeah, that's why Vic would always say, well, if you're gross motor skilled, genetically wired to use the large muscle groups of the body, you're better off doing a two-handed backhand. And if you're more fine motor skilled, you know, the one-handed backhand may be more suitable for you. Pretty, yeah, that's right. Pretty interesting. Pretty cool. Fascinating. Fascinating yeah, stuff, and yeah. and my research, my my research supports that. That's great. With Vic, I, you know, we we're the, the three of us are so fortunate to know Vic and professionally, personally. Well, one one thing about Neednagel's work with brain typing, uh, Vic traveled with his 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 book. I, I for maybe fifteen years, it was he he was constantly. So I mean, his, Vic's enthusiasm, you know, he I don't. You know, he would jump from one thing to the next with excitement. Like, say, for example, you know, <laughs> Bill Jacobson's Computen. It's the Steve. This is the ticket. This is gonna. This is gonna open the doors. This is gonna improve tennis so much. Or, or brain scans. But then, but he really, he never let go of. All, he really loved what uh, Need Nagel was putting together. With, um, I mean, he just took it to another level um, from the Myers Briggs mm-hmm. personality test right. in the in the fifties, but. Um, but he, I don't think he was really accepted by the scientific community because he he didn't have a PhD and I'm I'm not sure if his research was done in the lab or, you know, how that would, uh, be qualified. But, um, no, Vic was just fascinated with what, what Nidago was finding. And Vic thought that, uh, because it's not really... Brain typing is not scientifically validated, to my knowledge, to this point. But Vic used to think that it I don't, could, I don't it, believe it is either. I don't believe it is either. But Vic used to, his hunch was that it could be, you know, a DNA study. Yeah, I think such. they have done some. I mean, his son, Jeremy, I'm, I'm in contact with pretty regularly. And, and things are moving forward on that end. And, and Jeremy's really continuing to do a lot of that work. It, but his father's health well. is not very good, correct? He's, uh, you know, he's hanging in there. Yeah. From what I understand. So. With, um... Who's your favorite tennis player today? Do you find time to watch tennis? You're too busy. Oh, I love tennis. I love tennis. I watch all the time. Um, I'm still a big Rafa Nadal fan because I just love the work ethic. Mm. I love the effort. I love Federer's strokes. I love I love Nadal's work ethic. I'm just, I'm I'm still a big fan. Can you get out with your bad knees and hit some balls? <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Not often, but I get out. I <laughs> certainly I don't want to ever I don't want to ever not get out. I, I love the game too much. Yeah. I went through the Spanish school uh, three different times. Um, you had you you did some work with the Spanish Federation, correct? I did quite a bit. I, in fact, that's probably the country in Europe I've been to the most. Yeah. What is the name of the gentleman? I'm sure you've you worked with him. Uh, Are you thinking of Luis Madero? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, Luis runs the uh, RPT. The Real Professional Tennis in in Spain. I'm a, I'm an honorary member of that, as is Jim Lair, and um, the uh, they're certifying coaches and you know Sergio Bruguera, the Bruguera Academy and Dahl Academy. I mean, they're all. I mean, tennis is just growing mm-hmm. in Spain. It's 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 amazing. Well, I knew they did their their homework because um, when I went through their program, they they talked about you and Jim Lair. Which was oh, that's re- nice. Which is refreshing because I do that's, think that yeah. I do think that you know that's one thing not to beat up the 
the millennials or the X, Y, Z generation. But um, I do think that you, it's very important to get in the same room. I mean, I think, you know, I, I don't think that you can do everything at your fingertips. I don't think you can do everything via the computer. I mean, to actually hands-on experience and to go, you know, bricks and mortar is actually, you know, be with someone who's going to mentor you. Right. And, and history is a great teacher. And I think you never want to lose the history. Like one of the things that was really key to me was, you know, first I stand playing off, for example. I mean, you know, I didn't, I never wanted to lose the historical perspective that Stan brought and like even, even Bill Tilden's the spin of the ball, mm-hmm. you know, that book, I mean, I, I don't know when the last time you looked at that book, but that book was, I mean, if, you, if, if people that are listening haven't read that book, they really need to read that book because history is a great teacher. And um, we need to we need to not lose the legacy of history in the game. Yeah, that's one thing we're trying to do with some of these past teachers, just kind of keep the torch going a little bit. Right. Yeah, Bill Tilden, uh, you know, what beats baseline net? What beats net? Top spin. <laughs> and that's, right. that's not going to change. That's not going to change. No. No. Well, well, one I, question I had for you um, if you were to be commissioner of tennis for, for a day, what are some of the things you'd like to, <laughs> to add to, or, you know, that's kind of a cliche question, but with all your experience, uh, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I think they're, I think they've actually done a great job right now, but I think somebody has got to be in charge of like the, somebody has got to constantly be looking at the rules of the game. Um, like right now, here we are 2021 and they're arguing about the length of bathroom break, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, I saw that. yeah. <laughs> On. Somebody, somebody's got to be in charge of, of of the rules, and the rules have to be constantly updated to make the game better. I mean, think about it. When Jimmy Van Allen came out with the tiebreaker, everybody thought, "Oh no, you're going to ruin the sport." Mm. Um, when in fact, it's added nothing but excitement to the sport. Yeah. And the you know, I think we can't be afraid of change. So I think if you challenge me with that, I wouldn't be afraid of change. And I, but I also think somebody's got to be in charge. Somebody's got to really look at the rules and, you know, an eight minute bathroom break that they're arguing about right now here in 2021. Come on. Yeah. Murray and Sitsi Boss. Right. Yeah. And Andy was even saying, yeah, it's too bad that after this such a great match and, and, you know, I'm able to hang in there with the number three player in the world after everything I've been through, it's too bad that we're having to talk about bathroom breaks. Right. But that was the reality. Jack, what and about... I think, you know, yeah. Go ahead, Jack. Isn't, the, the athletes aren't doing anything that is against the rules. That's my point, though. Yeah. The commissioner has to, okay, let's let's constantly take a look at the rules. How can we make it better for so it's fair for all the players and enjoyable for the fans? I yeah. mean, would, think about the television contract. They don't want players taking an eight-minute bathroom break. Yeah, exactly. Or maybe Come they on. do. Maybe they can get eight minutes worth of advertising. <laughs> I don't think so. But no, I yeah. Think they're going to lose the viewer. Don't, don't hate the player, hate the game. Yeah. I think one thing, yeah, the, the, the cost of tennis, uh, it sounds like you didn't take lesson after lesson. Um, don't you think that that's something, too, with having a commissioner of tennis, like Andy's question? Um, like, say, the UTR, there's some certainly some positives, but the tournament director can make the entry fee anything they want. Mm. I think I think yeah, there's I think- need, need some regulations in that area. You know, coming back to the just the rules and regulations of the game, I mean, it's an umbrella, you know, mission for a commissioner would be important. Yeah. How do we make everything even? How do we make everything consistent? Yeah. So do you, do you have a tally on how many, how many countries you went to? I do have a tally. I've been to 52 countries. Over yeah. 7 million miles. I'm sure with all, all your travel, you were at so many teachers' conferences, uh, Peter, Most of those were tennis teachers' conferences in different countries. <laughs> Peter Burwash is way up there. Uh, he is. Oh, he's probably ahead of me. One of he's our got one of our students uh, we talked to the other day. Uh, we spent several years with Raven Claussen, and because he's been to so many countries in Africa, he's he's way up there. Well, as well, but fifty right. fifty two. Uh, uh, we're taking so much of your time. Really appreciate. It. Tell us, uh, pick out one country and tell us a story. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, the country that's probably nearest and dearest to my heart happened in the 80s, and that was in South Africa. And this was before apartheid. 
um, it was probably the biggest wake up call for me as a young white American boy. I go to South Africa for the Sports Federation of Southern Africa. The people are so nice. The people are so wonderful, but they've got apartheid and it's like there's not much diversity. And I was awakened um, to what it means to be a member of this world and be part of a diverse community to help and, and how tennis can really be, be a uniting force in bringing people together. That's probably the most favorite thing that I've learned. And don't get me wrong. I've had fun in every country. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> I've had a blast over the years. And the people that have hosted my visits have been phenomenal. I loved Australia. I got to Australia numerous times. I was there in 86 when they were building the state, the arena and the, and the site in, uh, in Melbourne. Um, that was incredible. You know, for Doug McCurdy, when he was head of development for the ITF, I mean, I went all over the world. I mean, some of the most fun trips were in Latin America and to Asia with Doug. And, um, it was, uh, I've had a good run. It's been a great journey. I've really, and I've, I've got more to do. Yeah. No, it's really fun to talk to you. Um, just to hear the names. I have, I remember Doug, he used to send students to our program. When he right. Was, he was in, uh, they moved from Wimbledon to Queens, but at one point I was in his office. It wasn't during, That's the, right. it wasn't during the tournament. And I go, this is amazing. He goes, your, I go, your office is right at Wimbledon. He goes, well, let me show you. And he, politely knocked on the door across the hall. He goes, well, Steve, my office is not that this nice. Can you, we just popped our head in this office across the hall and you look through the window and you saw center court. Jeez. I know. That was I know. impressive. Actually, the, yeah, the, the Dave Fish at Harvard, they, they moved his office at one point, but, uh, but he had an, an office where it looked out his window and saw the oldest football stadium in America. Wow. But, uh, <laughs> wow. Your, but tennis has been a gateway. I mean, what your eyes have seen. There's a line in the movie, Rudy. This is the most beautiful. Yeah. This is the most beautiful yeah. scene. This eye, yeah. These yeah. eyes I've ever seen. Yeah. Tennis, but, um, tennis opened my entire career. I mean, without tennis, it's, it, it, you know, the corporate stuff, Jim and I starting together, the human performance Institute that, you know, we lived a dream by starting with, with no money at all, our own money and just selling it to a fortune 50 company. And it was all because of, I mean, really started with our work in tennis and, I, I'm so appreciative of the sport. I mean, beyond words. No, you you and Jim did so much for the game. Uh, that's what Andy said as far as we're trying to carry the torch. We're still in the trenches. And, you know, people ask me sometimes, Steve, what do you do? And I go, I, I fight ignorance every day. <laughs> and <laughs> with, um, and, you know, Dave Anderson, uh, you've you certainly influenced him. He was with our, with our program in Texas. And he's been the... Sure. The director of oh the flagship for Brookhaven for 25, 30 years. Right. We spoke right. to him and we said, what do you think tennis needs? And he said, we need the the theme from the movie Back to the Future. But we we uh, we need to circle back and, and not forget what people like you and Jim Lair have done for the game. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been a, it's been an adventure. It's been a journey and it, I, I have zero regret. That's great. I know you've written so many books, but um, if people want to find more out, you know, about you and your books and things like that, where, where should we send them? Well, probably Amazon. We've probably got a listing. I mean, they're not really in print anymore. We can still get them. I mean, high tech tennis is yeah. probably what I'm best known for in the tennis industry. And then, in the lay industry, the corporate athlete is probably the book that I'm most well known for in the business world. Um, I've written several books. Paul Rodert and I wrote a book, you know, uh, with human kinetics. It's, it's available. So I've got, there's quite a bit probably on Amazon they can find. Okay, cool. Or just do a search on my name, Jack Groffle, and then books. And I don't even know what comes up. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I don't even know what comes we up. We did do a search. I know you, I think you wrote one in Spanish, right? Hablas Español? Well, the, uh, no, no, no. No, no, un, un poquito. Um, <laughs> the, uh, what happened was that was high tech tennis or oh, okay. tennis for advanced players, and they were reprinted. That that book's been reprinted in Spanish, in Russian, in uh, Japanese, and Korean. Oh, cool! Wow. Yeah, that's great. All right, and are you active on social media much these days? Or yeah, I'm on I'm on LinkedIn probably the most. I'm, okay. I've got a pretty good following on LinkedIn, 
if anybody wants to connect with me. But then I'm on Instagram and I'm on Twitter for entertainment. I don't really tweet very much, <laughs> uh, but I'm on Instagram with family and friends, but yeah. mostly I'm connected on LinkedIn. Yeah. Actually, over the last two years, uh, Andy has been here with his wife. He, I was doing a camp in Germany and uh, Andy met his wife. We were, he was helping me out and they've been here for the last two years and we've really, through their efforts, we've really reached a lot. Um, she's worked as a volunteer and helped him, uh, day in and day out. Um, we've reached a lot more people, I think with, you know, common sense. I mean, common sense is not common. I mean, have the strings go towards the target. <laughs> <laughs> what a revelational concept. What? Yeah. yeah. That's like earth shattering. Stuff. Have a hitting zone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, but no, thanks so much for your time. It's great. I know. Oh uh, my gosh, people, guys. It's so people, great. So great to get caught up with you. A lot yeah. of people will appreciate learn, listening to you. That's great. Let's do it again sometime. Yeah. Time's all right. Fun. Jack, thanks right. again. Appreciate Thank you, it. Jack. Super. All we'll the be best to both of you. All thanks right. for all you do for the game. Take care. Oh, you too. Thanks, Jack. Bye-bye. Adios. Well, it was a great conversation. If, I mean, it's 90 minutes already. I feel like we could just go on and on. 90 minutes, I'm thinking I met him in 1979. I'll have to do the math. The time goes by too fast. Yeah. Life There's only, how's short. it go? There's only, uh, only one bad thing about the youth, only the young have it. <laughs> A blink of an eye goes goes by too fast. But uh, no, I mean, he's an amazing personality, amazing uh, speaker. Obviously, he's done so much. Yeah. Um, but you know, it was fun to, to meet him way back when, but uh, it was even more fun to have him help all these students that we had that were making a, a career for themselves in tennis teaching. Yeah. And still going. I mean, I know uh, there's a conference coming up. I read something about he's, he's doing a presentation. So yeah. And soon we'll the work. We're continues. Gonna, soon we're going to talk to Jim Lair. Uh, yeah. Which will be fine as well. Yeah. All right, everybody. Um, thanks for listening. You can find out more information on what we're doing. Great base tennis.com. Find us on social media at great base tennis. If you get a chance to leave a review, for our podcast, trying to spread spread the word a little bit on uh, iTunes and other places that's available. Leave us a review. Appreciate it. And until next time, anything to add, Smith? Dr. Jack Grapple. Yeah, thanks so notes. much. Notes. I, I have lots of notes. Dr. Jack Grapple, he certainly uh, um, was a big influence on not only what I do, but uh, um, so many other people in the game. Yeah. All right, everybody, thanks again for listening, and we'll... Catch you in the next one. Yeah, thanks. Adios.